Hey, Russ, how are you doing today? I'm good, Charles. How are you? Well, thanks for joining me, and uh, I'm looking forward to a, a great conversation here about Morgan Dollars and some, a little bit about Peace Dollars when we get to the end of this. Um, for the people who are not live, uh, the stream is going to be saved on our YouTube channel, and you can uh, watch it at your own pace, at your own leisure. You can even double back uh, and watch this again. Um, Russ Augustine is my guest today. Uh, I've known Russ uh, for as long as I've been in the coin industry. Uh, he is one of the most reputable dealers in the uh, in the hobby. Uh, he uh, represents AU Capital Management. He also works with Rare Cola, uh, which is a, another one of these uh, tremendous firms. Um, and uh, Russ kind of cut his teeth uh, as a, an analytical coin dealer. And what I mean by that is uh, Russ looked beyond the numbers, beyond the pop reports, beyond the mintages, and was able to identify coins that were underpriced uh, given the uh, current market levels. Uh, and uh, he became a major buyer uh, of coins, worked for Blanchard, uh, and uh, gained an enormous reputation uh, as a, a, a dependable and reliable numismatic expert. Uh, and uh, so when we talk about coins uh, today, uh, know that you're getting the type of insight that comes with years of shoe leather experience and, uh, and the types of uh, insights into the coin market that a red book isn't going to tell you and uh, eBay auction uh, results aren't going to tell you. Uh, we're going to talk about a variety of coins uh, in different grades. Uh, Russ was kind enough to send me actually a, a long box of uh of uh morgan and peace dollars and some raw coins most of these are going to be graded by pcgs and ngc there is a cat coin in here but uh, we're going to talk more about the coin itself and less about the holder uh today uh, we have uh, a few of these dates we have coins in the same grade from the different services but they have different characteristics and uh when we talk about coins especially when you're talking about building a quality collection uh it's not necessarily the grade that's the most important thing. The coin, every coin talks to you and says something. And so if NGC or PCGS grade two different qualities of coins in the same grade, it doesn't necessarily mean that the grade is wrong. It just means that you have to understand what the coin is saying. And what the coin tells you is kind of where the value, mostly where the value comes from. Um, there's certainly a base level. You know, if you get a run-of-the-mill coin that traditionally sells for $150, then you know that essentially that's the baseline for the grade or for the date. But if a coin with the same grade routine, uh, routinely is bringing $180, $200, $250, $300, then it's not necessarily that the coin's undergraded. It's just telling you something different. And, and so we're going to get into that kind of conversation we're gonna have a little. We're gonna have a little bit of fun with coins. And, and Russ, thank you uh, for taking a, an hour or so of your time this morning to join us. It's a pleasure. So, Russ, um, before we start talking about graded coins, we have a lot of people who aren't. I wouldn't say they're necessarily collectors, but they're people who have a, a numismatic interest has been spurred because they have come into contact with coins. And I often get emails. Our comments posted to our website saying, I have this coin and can you tell me what it's worth? And, or they'll read a little bit and they'll say, um, I want to get my coin graded because I saw that there's a, the same date is worth like $10,000. And this usually happens when like, you know, let's say a top pop coin sells and there's a press release, uh, 1881s Morgan dollar sells for fifteen thousand dollars at like some auction company, and all of a sudden they have one in their in their top drawer, and they they're they're thinking about paying off that credit card bill or some, or whatever, and they they want that fifteen thousand dollars, so they'll reach out to me and they'll say, you know, can you help me? Can you buy my coin and give me my money? And and often the coin will look like, um, well, it'll look like this. Hold on. So this is a, uh, a well-circulated uh, Morgan dollar here. Um, and in fact, this one's been polished, as you can, you can kind of see in the screen. And 
this is kind of the, t the the typical kind of grade you'll see for a circulated coin. And w what is the difference, Russ, between a coin that would be outside of the numismatic market for a long time, but but taken from like circulation or held by the general public in a coin that you'd want to want to see graded? Uh, the first, I get a lot of those phone calls too. Uh, I think we all do. And uh, we each have a way of handling them. Um, the way I would handle it in particular is how did you come by the coin? Because more often than not, you're going to find that this coin was in an attic collection or um, it was strewn about with cufflinks and small change. And it had happened to be in uh, your dad's top drawer of his dresser. This is what I call an attic collection coin. Um, it didn't have any rhyme or reason as to why it was there. It just was cool. On the other hand, and this is where it kind of piques my interest, if the coin in question was um, in an album or in a capital plastic holder, uh, which is what coins used to be in when they were somewhat special before certification came along. Then it gets, then I ask a few more questions. Uh, you know, what's the condition? Uh, and of course, that's kind of a loaded question because they say it's in great condition, always because they can see the detail. Um, Fortunately, we have cell phones now with a very high resolution, so the the question can be handled pretty quickly as to uh, what the actual condition might be. Uh, so the cell phone picture would come across, and you say, well, that's a good coin, or no, it's really not worth your while certifying it. So, uh, And also, the date of the coin uh, tells a lot, too. If it's a 1921 Morgan dollar, which is what you have pictured right now, uh, that's a run-of-the-mill coin, and it's thirty to forty dollars. Mm -hmm. Certification now, I think, is thirty-five, so it's really not worth certifying, and that ends the phone call usually. Right. And it's always a shame, in my opinion, to have those phone calls because, for for me, like I I don't want somebody's first experience, you know, with numismatics being told, yeah, what you have is junk or not really worth anything or whatever like that, because it kind of, you know, I'm not saying that, I mean, usually these calls are fairly mercenary that people just want to sell it. And that's their, it's certainly a normal reaction to finding something that you're not all that interested in, but you realize it has some value. But, but I, I, I the, to me, the most depressing thing is somebody gets a hold of some coins, thinks they're neat, but wants to sell them. And then you tell them they're not worth anything and, and or not worth what they think they're worth. And then, and then you said, and then you, they, they were like, oh, really? And then, and then you say, but, but coin collecting is really fun hobby. And, and just because these aren't particularly, you know, uh, going to enrich you doesn't mean that it isn't interesting to own them and to look at them and learn about them. So, right. uh, so, so let's, let's dispel with the circulated coins. So, so folks legitimately, the coins that get graded tend to be in what we call mint state. Uh, mint state means that when the mint, which is the factory that makes money, strikes the coins, that the the raw uh, blank or planchet goes into the press, the design is stamped on it, and at that point, it's like in you know the pristine amount of detail for the design is imparted on the coin. It's bright, it's lustrous, it has not been used, worn, soiled, and and they are typically put not by hand in any tray or holder they're put in a giant bag they get sent around the country and uh sent to banks eventually and then put into circulation but if the coin remains uncirculated that it hasn't been spent it hasn't been handled uh then the coin is in what we call mint state and mint state uh in the modern coin market runs the gamut from looks like it got beat up, you know, and, and is not circulated, but it's been hit by a bunch of coins over and over again, scratched and marked up. Sometimes the color, that bright color that was originally on the coin is dulled, although there's no wear on it. It doesn't have any luster. It's not, it's not flashy. Sometimes the coin's tone because of the 
uh, oxidation with the, uh, the the metal and the atmosphere around it may turn it may turn it different colors, usually dull, uh, usually dull uh, yellow or brown, but sometimes very vivid and colorful rainbow colors. Um, and then uh, sometimes the coins are almost free of scratches, like very rarely, very free of most scratches, look absolutely gorgeous as if they just came off the press. And those are the coins that typically are most sought after by the high-end collector, and that's where the high-end uh, prices come. So the coins that we have today, Russ, they run from from gem to superb gem, and uh, or, or or I'd say choice to superb gem. And in numismatics, we call choice uncirculated coin typically an MS sixty three or an MS sixty four. Once you get to MS sixty five, we call that generally a gem. And once the coin reaches the threshold of MS sixty seven, we call that a superb gem. And uh, Numismatics is an evolving uh, science as, as, as anything is. Uh, and it used to be that gym was like, if you had a gym, you had the best. And now there's like, and, and, and MS-65 was gym, and that denoted you had the, you know, the, the, the higher tier coin. And now MS-65 has really become a middling grade in the uncirculated world because there's 66s, 67s, 68s, sometimes 69s. And, uh, and, and all of these grades are really varied in the Morgan Dollar series based on the date and the strike quality and how many were preserved and maybe released, uh, you know, to collectors and, and, and kept uh, free of contact of other coins. And it's really a date by date, mint by mint um, issue that you have to look at. So even a common coin, common in MS 65, 66 could become extremely valuable at 67 if there's only a few of those coins. So let's start. We'll go for the first one. We'll go through uh, some of these coins. We're going to go more or less a numer uh, date chronological order. We're going to skip some dates, obviously. We're not going to cover the whole series. But um, we're going to get your thoughts and, and uh, we're going to kind of help collectors understand where these coins are in today's market. So let's go with the first one here which will be an 1878 um, S. So, um, you know, when I think about the 1878 Russ, uh, a few things that's, that pop out for me, you know, this is an issue with a mintage of uh, 9,774,000. So, so that's pretty much the, uh, the San Francisco Mint was trying to churn out as many of these as they could uh, because the uh, legislation required the Mint to strike tens of millions of these a year. Um, PCGS has graded 60,247 of this issue. NGC 58,875. So that's a, a combined mint state certified population of 119,122 coins. Obviously there's some crossovers and things like that, but there's not a, a huge number of crossovers in the lower grades. So we're looking at 1.2% of the total mintage of this date is in a slab right now. Um, th this is the first S mint, Morgan. And uh, the coins went into production. Uh, there was a first strike ceremony in April 17th. And a day later, they started striking these coins. Uh, but this is a perennial favorite, uh, the 1878 S uh, Morgan dollar. Uh, for uh, for for any coin collector. So, what, what's your opinion on the date and uh, on coins in this gem level? Well, for as long as I can remember, and um, and and in this business, and it's approaching forty years now. Um, the first year of issue for almost any denomination, but specifically eighteen seventy eight Morgan and silver dollars, has been a perennial favorite because there are. are uh, three different mints, and you have a variety of varieties. Um, you have eight tail feather, seven over eight tail feather, strong, weak, and then you have uh, the Carson City, of course, and then the San Francisco mint. Um, so it, there's always been a demand for this kind of coin, as far as uh, I can tell, and it's always carried uh, a premium, and the premium gets higher as the grade increases 
Uh, this particular coin uh, has been selected um, to be put into an NGC green holder for its uh, all of those attributes um, as being as good as, if not equal, uh, better than like maybe a CAC coin. Uh, I find it's well struck. It's it has a nice presentation. Um, it is enhanced by the peripheral toning. There's no visible marks whatsoever on the coin. Uh, and it also has um, rich toning on the reverse and uh, around it and through the denticles. Mm -hmm. Also, um, for 1878, you have a lot of, of which once collectors get into the series, they also go for varieties that are, are, are further than the ones that I just mentioned, which are called VAM varieties. And the 1878 issues carry a lot of different VAM varieties. So that increases their popularity. So with the uh, with the 1878S, you know, the, the, the San Francisco issue, um, the, you know, like with a 9 million mintage and a hundred and some thousand in, in, in slabs, th this is prevalent coin. And you're looking at uh, market levels that are pretty much, I would say, you know, they, they, they move when everything moves. There's not going to be a, a run on this date if there's not a run on uh, a, like any type coin date. So uh, I'm seeing like the market for this coin in the uh, in the three level being around 150, 160 bucks. Uh, and uh, on the high end, uh, the, the sort of the lower mill run of the mill ones may be a little lower. Uh, and, and then Jimmy ones, you know, I'm I'm seeing them. You know, uh, in the three to three fifty level, uh, you know, for sort of run of the mill, four hundred plus for coins that are are, are are PQ. I mean, where would you where would you put? Uh, is my market read kind of close to where you're at on this, or is there yeah. something to look at here with this per, this particular type of coin that's like vivid luster but has some peripheral toning? Does this coin bring a little more, in your opinion? Does it what? Would it bring a little more with this, bring a this little look? More. Okay. Um, well, right now, the PCGS published price is $485. Um, that's an interesting rule uh, of thumb as to where the value could be. Um, and just as a notation, uh, a 66 is at $1,100 and a 67 is at $10,000. Mm -hmm. um, the, while the published price is an interesting indication as to uh, sort of a baseline. Uh, what I do when I value coins, not just silver dollars, um, is I look at auction records, and I also uh, take into the uh, into consideration the average of the auction records. Um, it gives me an idea as to where the coin has been, what it's doing now, and what it might do in the future. For example, in MS65, which we're talking about. Um, the 25 the past 25 auction records for this coin it averages 375 dollars but if you look at the past 10 auction records the average is much it's 25 dollars higher at 401. Mm -hmm. the highs are both at 528 so that's your ceiling and the lows are at about 323 for the past 10 years and 260 for the past 25, I'm sorry, past 25 auction appearances. What it shows me is that the, this coin is going up in value. Mm -hmm. The low has gone from 264 to 323. The average has gone from 370 to 401 and as high as 422 for PC just coins. So that's what I would look at as far as the value is concerned. And that's how I would evaluate almost any Morgan dollar as well as other coins, even if they don't trade so frequently. Yeah, and, it, and it's very important, I think, for collectors to realize this, that if um, you see a, an auction price that is an outlier, um, there, there's usually some, usually, not always, there's, all, there's always black swan events where a, a unknowledgeable collector will over, dra drastically overpay for a coin. But usually there's some sort of knowledge that maybe is not explicit in the listing that explains why multiple bidders 
are going to chase a particular coin in a particular grade. And like Russ was talking about earlier, that could be a VAM, a VAM variety that's really popular, that's just been missed by the, the, the person listing the, the, the coin. Um, it, could, it could be um, some, some you know, detail about the coin that, that two people are very excited about. If there's a, you know, just a monster toner coin that, you know, maybe got CAC approval and got through the, the process, you know, the question there is like when you go, what is the price? It's like, well, find me another one. And sometimes you can't. And so an 1878, an MS-65 with like plus, 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 plus toning, that's like been vetted as being legitimate toning by knowledgeable uh, experts. You know, that coin could sell for three or $4,000. And when the price guide is telling you it's a $300 coin and the people bidding on it aren't nuts, that's just what the market is for the unicorn coin in the grade. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, very, it's very much a, a situation of, you know, if you don't understand why a coin's an outlier, you don't want to include that in your sample size when you're looking at just a coin that is going to be typical for the grade. But those outliers don't necessarily mean that the people bidding on it have gone crazy either. Like uh, the the high price of five hundred and twenty eight dollars, which is, you know, anywhere from twenty five to thirty percent higher than the average. I'll either go right into that auction record and see if the coin has that attribute you just mentioned, like a color or a van variety or something like that. What made it sell for five hundred twenty eight dollars? And invariably, I'll take that out of the average as well as the lowest coin, like the the one that sold for $264, I'll take that out. So you get kind of a mean uh, estimate as to where that market should be. Yeah. And then, yeah. then you compare it with the published prices. And then if you don't have a coin in hand, but you need the coin or you want to buy the coin, then the fun begins in hunting the one that's just right for you. And sometimes you can get that coin that's like a nicer coin for an average price, but that's a hunt. Right. Well, and the one thing to keep in mind with what Russ is saying, I, I think there's two ways to go about buying these coins, right? So one, one is you can go through a reputable dealer who handles a lot of material. And if you have a very specific need, like, you know, if I went to you, Russ, and said, hey, Russ, you know, I'm putting I'm putting together a, you know, 10 coin Morgan set. These are all going to be type coins. But but the, what, what I want my set to be is all blast white or all all real toning, or I want them to be all like early die state or all perfect strikes. You handle enough of these coins to, to be able to say, okay, well, I can, I can, I can pick out some for you. I mean, obviously you're not going to get rich off of this like collection I'm building. <laughs> you know, this is just going to be more or less, you know, the course of like, you know, doing business, but you would see enough to know that with 116,000 or coins and slabs, there is no shortage of this material if you're just going for an average coin. But if you want a above average coin, you don't have to buy the first one that comes down the, the, the lane. So you, you do want to work with dealers that know the series if you're going for something that's a little bit above, you know, run of the mill. So um, seeing a coin in hand is a good idea. Working with a knowledgeable expert is a, gr a better idea, but you don't want to like just snag the first thing you come come across because it, it's you think it's slipping through the cracks. It could be reaching its full potential at a below market uh, level. I agree. Um, in fact, just yesterday, uh, a friend and a client called me from Minnesota, and he uh, told me a little story about how he lost this 1878 coin when he was a dollar when he was a kid, and he's always wanted one. So he says, I hate to bother you with this, but, you know, can you help me out? Well, Having this relationship with Raricoa means that we have over 26,000 Morgan dollars right behind this wall in a vault. And um, I was able to go and out of, I would say maybe 80 to 90 1878 coins in MS 63 and 64, I pulled five that I would call a little bit proof-like, a little bit of cameo, which is exactly what he asked for. So that kind of lends to your choosing the right dealer, someone who actually has the ability to go through and compare instead of you running around to a coin show all the time, you know, 
invariably coming up empty handed. But someone who has the, uh, the ability to compare and contrast some of the um, some of the examples that are available. Right. I mean, it's it's a real luxury, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, and that doesn't mean you won't find that needle in the haystack. I mean, you, you will. Right. But, you know, I'm we're talking about playing the odds and improving your potential to be in a better position. So if you know what yeah. you're doing, you don't need me or you don't need Russ. You can go do it yourself. But if but if you need help, but you do need some mentorship, at least in the beginning as you get going. And then usually what you'll find is you will build a relationship that will last decades with somebody and and the result of those relationships have been all of the historic collections that have ever been assembled there there's not been a, a major collector who's put together a world class collection that hasn't had a team of numismatists work on them work with them on that collection so and and that that goes for collections that are pick a topic it could be civil war tokens it could be indian peace medals it could be yeah. you know 1804 dollars there's always somebody there on the team helping them out so let's go to the next coin here okay so the next coin here is an 1878 cc we have two of these to show you um this is in a pcgs uh 64 holder and uh the 1878 cc is uh this is going to be one of those gsa coins but let's go over some of the basic numbers first uh, so the mintage was two million two hundred twelve thousand, which is uh, it, it's not a super low mintage. We'll see lower mintages in our our list here, but but it but in, by modern standards, this was a low mintage. PCGS has graded thirty seven thousand five hundred fifty five of these. NGC has graded thirty two thousand and ten. So that's a combined certified population in all grades. That's 69,565. That's 3.1% of the total mintage. Um, it's interesting to note here, think about that 69,000 number. At the time of the GSA sale, when the Treasury eliminated its stockpile of Carson City dollars, there were only 60,919 of these coins in that distribution. Now, NGC and P suggest obviously there's some crossovers here. I don't know if there's like 9,000 crossovers. I, I certainly wouldn't be surprised if there were. But what I'm kind of kind of alluding to here is that the vast majority of the coins that are in slabs are from that GSA hoard and, and not from earlier earlier releases. Um, the second one here, and we'll kind of we'll go back and forth, is uh, in an NGC 64 holder. So this is the same grade. Uh, this one happens to have a CAC sticker, and and I don't know if Russ, if you know whether or not the PC one was submitted for CAC or not. But you've handled these coins in hand, and and in your opinion, side by side, what what are the differences uh, between the two? Um, well, CAC certainly likes originality, and uh, the NGC coin has that. Um, with regard to the uh, the PC Jess coin, um, it has uh, sort of a an even contrast. It has a light hazy toning on the peripheries, especially on the upper portion of the obverse. Um, there's some broken luster on the cheek, uh, but the fields are largely intact. The um, the reverse, the toning is uh, sort of repeating itself as it did, as we see on the obverse. Um, I think it's very pleasing and there's a good deal of cartwheel luster. As I turn the coin kind of like this, I get that cartwheel luster under the light. Right. Um, there are a couple of scuffs hidden in the fields and that sort of uh, confirms the uh, very choice, brilliant, uncirculated MS-64 grade. Um, with regard to the uh, NGC coin, um, I find that it shares the same contrast as the PCGS coin. Uh, on the obverse, um, there are breaks and luster on the cheek. Um, some are more shallow than others, but it's it's really uh, not discernible, um, especially as I'm not using a loop. If I were to take a seven power loop to this thing, I'd see it. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few. Uh, but not many um, 
minor ticks in the field, both on the obverse uh, and on the reverse. Um, it, uh, you know, I think CAC sees a lot of these coins, um, probably more than they want to, uh, mm -hmm. as you're going through the population data. But they definitely like the blue and the brown. Um, I, I, you know, those are the gold spot there right. on the coins. Um, I think that that's, uh, that's a good indication as to uh, why it got the, uh, the uh, third party endorsement. No, you know, it's interesting to me because, uh, you know, I, I've talked to John about sort of the way he approaches uh, these coins. And, and, and I don't want to, you know, take that I speak for him or can completely recall uh, verbatim what he told me. But one of the things I, I guess he suggested was that um, he looks at series on a series by series basis and how they're supposed to kind of how we come to expect them to look. And I think that the Morgan dollar market, it, it's an interesting market. And I think par partly because we have so many coins that you can have a mature original market and you can have a mature uh, processed market. And what I mean by processed is that you take a coin that has a slight bit of haze on it. Uh, you use non-abrasive, numismatically sound chemical uh, dips and you return the coin to close to its original color, although you can't perfectly nail it. But it's, 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 it, it creates this like blast white Morgan look that there's a large audience that wants coins to look like that. Um, and then you have the other side where even if the coin is like, let's just say has Gallimaufry toning or uh, that they would prefer to see a coin mature and have a patina than to know that it's been it's been dipped to, to artificially look like it's brand new. Like, I'm not necessarily going to ask you, Russ, what your personal preference is, but how can you speak to like the, the market and what the market tends to prefer? Uh, as far as the toning is concerned, yeah, like like do 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 people ex do do you find that when people come to you, they expect the blast white coins, which means that they're ex they're accepting the fact that like they've been numismatically processed, or do do collectors come to you more often than not and say, "I don't want those coins; I want totally original." Um, it's it's for the Morgan dollar market. Um, I find it's a little bit different than the rest of the numismatic U.S. numismatic market. Um, there are more market participants, in my opinion, for Morgan silver dollars than there are for any other series. Um, and because the toning, um, you never can get consistency with toning. Uh, you know, some coins are going to be brown, some will be blue, some will be yellow, some will have spotting, some will not. I have found that, uh, and most uh, most registry set clients that I've dealt with prefer white, blast white. Okay, so maybe, I mean, coins come out of canvas bags, as you mentioned earlier, uh, at banks, white. But if they've been in contact with the canvas, they have toning. Um, however, most clients, collectors, uh, maybe even investors, will pr uh, prefer to have that white coin. Um, it makes it a little bit more difficult to find that right coin because the marks show up more. They're, they're, they're more evident. Um, but, you know, grading becomes easier with a white coin rather than a dark coin. But again, as I said in, initially with the 78 CC, uh, CAC likes originality, which is why that NGC uh, coin has got the endorsement. And you'll see that also in the prices realized. Um, the prices on this one are, you know, have some interesting, you know, highs and lows and averages as well. Well, you know, it's interesting that you're talking about like the, the market preferring that black, that blast white coin or, or many sort of investors uh, preferring that. Because I, I think like if we go out beyond Morgan dollars, and I don't want to go too far off of the topic because we have a lot to cover. But when you when you look at, um, let's say, uh the classic investor buy would, or the, the the investor buy maybe the 1980s would have been uh, type 
circulated or uncirculated Liberty Head 20s or St. Gaudens 20s common dates. And we've seen uh, a change uh, with the uh, production of monster boxes of American gold eagles, where if you're like a telemarketer guy or whatever, it's it's you, you have to go for a different approach because like you can get a brand new gold eagle that looks perfect, no scratches on it, or you can go get uh, a St. Gaudens 20 from 1924 or something that you're paying a premium for, obviously, because there's some numismatic uh, uh, mark up there. And, and the thing will be, you know, uncirculated, but it'll be like scuffed at the knees and the face. There'll be marks all over it. And then the buyer is going to, they, they want to know why their coins aren't perfect. And then you're like, well, if you wanted a perfect 1924 St. Gaudens uh, Double Eagle, we're not talking about the, the, the markup you got on it. We're talking about going to a major auction and waiting uh, every couple of years for one to show up. So, so I, do think, I do think that like, because of the prevalence of bullion coins being produced by the mints now, that, that some of the non-numismatic-oriented consumers are looking for perfection when it doesn't exist in classic coins. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 1986 saw the the U.S. Mint ushering into, they're probably the greatest marketer of coins that has ever existed. You know, move over Max Mel, right? right. You know, here they are. Um, uh, and as a result, you know, they've got a, a huge following. But perfection uh, is what they're all known for. And grading, you know, if you see an MS-69 or a Proof 69 Ultra Cameo, Sometimes you scoff at that because you want that perfect 70 grade. You can't get it any better than 70. And yes, it does create a problem when you're dealing with a pre-1933 gold coin. It's like, why can't I get a 70 grade? <laughs> well, you know, an MS67, as you were mentioning, I mean, I just saw one for advertised for sale yesterday at $13,500. Mm -hmm. That certainly doesn't have any relationship to the underlying spot gold price. No, no. So let's uh, let's get back to our topic because <laughs> we could do this all day. Um, I know, right? All right. So the next stay the with us, guys. stay with us, everybody. <laughs> all right. So uh, we're still in the eighteen seventies. We got three coins here. These are eighteen. That's eighteen seventy nine S Morgan dollar, and you you provided one. The first one here is uh, in an NGC sixty five holder. In fact, they're all all three of them are going to be uh, gems. So uh, then you we have a PCGS sixty five. And uh, an NGC uh, 65 with a green holder that uh, I think Rare Koa is uh, as, as marketing. Uh, but a little bit about the coin first. So again, we're in the, we're in the early stages of production. Uh, the, the mint is being compelled by law to create tens of millions a year. And the treasury sub vaults are filling up with these things because they're not generally circulating at the quantity of, at which they're being struck. So for 1879, the San Francisco Mint struck 9,110,000, uh, of which uh, PCGS has graded 122,247, and NGC has graded 117,095 for a combined graded population of 239,342 coins. That's like an astronomical amount of slabs, if you ask me. 2.6% of the total mintage has been graded. And that means that at least that amount of the total mintage survives in uncirculated condition. There's is probably double or triple that. There are uncirculated coins that are just not in a high enough state of preservation to justify the cost of getting them graded. When you look at the POPs, the cluster of typical grades will range from MS-63 to MS-66. The coin is still quote unquote affordable at MS sixty six. And and because that's true, Russ, um one question I'll ask you is uh are gems still gems like if, are MS sixty five gems still gems when the pop skews to the fact that there are a lot of sixty sixes. Uh and the last thing I'll say is uh uh there are hundred and fifty four uh of this date and, and mint that are graded in MS-68. So when there's that many 66s, 67s, and 68s, what does that communicate to a, a dealer and to a buyer? 
when we're looking at coins in that 65 level? That's a lot of questions. That's a good question. Um, that's a good question. I'll take it from in the reverse order. The, I think that, uh, you know, if I see that there are that many MS68s, the first thing that comes to my mind, that's the baseline coin. There, there are plenty to choose from. And the auction prices then come into great play because uh, while I will take into consideration the public prices, published prices from uh, PCJS.com, uh, from ngccoin.com, and also from the Coin Dealer Newsletter, which I'm not sure publishes MS68. But then I will go to the auction records and take a very serious look at MS68. And not so much, but definitely include M that uh, kind of research for MS67. But those are that's the baseline price for all Morgan dollars with populations that high. Um, I, and as a result, you actually can look at this coin in an interesting, in an investment, in a, an investment way, because as a common day coin, you're going to have more and more examples showing up for sale, therefore creating a track record. Then if you are on top of things or you have a good relationship with a dealer, you can keep track of what that value is without having to buy or sell your coin to figure it out on your own. So I like those coins, um, but I, I also think that, you know, a white MS67 should be bought at a certain level. And if you see it going higher over time, it, you might want to hold off and look at another grade if you're looking for that particular date and mint. The uh, the coin you're showing, um, what is the last three digits that you're showing? Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I have the, uh, actually, uh, uh, make sure I didn't. Is it 039? No, no. For some reason, I threw up the uh, 1881 S. Let me grab the uh, 79 S's. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. That was my bad. My, I, I kind of threw my son off here. <laughs> so anyway, here we go. We have the 1879 S's. So we have two 65s here. Uh, the NGC one is uh, 039. That's the one that's appearing on the screen. Uh, and then the other one is the uh, uh, PCGS MS65 with the 686 certain number. Okay. So I'll take the NGC first. Um, what uh, what I see here is the um, the obverse cheek and the field will have small contact marks. So you can expect contact marks in a gem mint state 65 coin. Um, there is a horizontal line that appears on the cheek at dead center. That can turn people off because if all of a sudden your eye is uh, immediately directed to um, an aberration on the coin surface, you can bet that when you go to sell the coin, that's, that same aberration is going to affect your potential buyer. Uh, the reverse has a light scrape to the right of, right of the uh, right wing in the field. But otherwise, it's, you know, I think it's a, a very acceptable example of a gem brilliant uncirculated Min State 65 coin. Um, for the PCGES coin, um, it uh, has a similar contact marks on the obverse that appear uh, at the throat and are more pronounced on the left-hand side field. There is some discoloration um, uh, on both the surface of the obverse and the reverse. Darker spots, I see darker spots um, on both, in both the uh, field and the devices. Um, some may feel that this PCGS coin even though Morgan dollar buyers tend to think that a PCGS coin is better than an NGC coin, um, some people might find uh, not find this that attractive and pass on it more often than they'll play. And, and that speaks to the, the, the very large population, right? Because we're looking at a coin where there's no shortage of, uh, of coins. And again, I'll, I'll get back to my initial question, though. On 1879S in particular, like with this huge population, with many, many coins graded higher, and, and, and keep in mind that 1879S is one of the best dates for high-end coins in the Morgan Dollar series, but it doesn't hold a candle to the 1881S. Um, <laughs> does, does, is this gym grade, as we call it, is it, in your opinion, still jimmy given the way the population of this, uh, this coin skews higher? 
Yes. I mean, the, their coins are technically graded, uh, certainly by the, you know, the contact marks, um, strike, co you know, sometimes color. But, you know, I think there's a level playing field for the most part. Great. Great. And um, you have this this green holder one. This is one that yeah. Rare Color is going. And this is a this is a, a, a special program that you guys put together. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, well, it's I, I'm uh, I'm sort of a uh, on the wings of this program since Morgan Dollars uh, are are even though they're in my program, I'm, it's not my specialty. But um, the Greenholder program was designed um, to endorse coins of a higher quality and a higher standard, um, similar to what CAC brought to the market. Um, not too long ago. Uh, because of the cost of the coins going to CAC and the time involved, um, I think John has expressed, uh, you know, the fact that he just couldn't grade all of these silver dollars and, and you know, and, and give them a, a sticker without probably going crazy and tearing his head, his hair out. So um, Rareco has come up with a program where of the 26,000 Morgan silver dollars we have in stock at the moment, we go through each one of them and identify them as a higher grade coin for that grade. I mean, the earlier example I gave of the 78S, I pulled four coins out of 90. Um, these could easily be destined for the green holder program. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it, it, the green holders are sold, um, by retail companies only, they're not traded wholesale. Uh, it's because we want to give the collector a real fair and fighting chance to have like an exquisite coin that will be uh, bought back without question, sight unseen, as long as it's in that green holder at a published number that we we uh, update every day. Hmm. Interesting. So are, are most of these coins going to be white coins in your, your, your experience? Or? No. No, 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 no. We've got tone coins in there. It's we take every every aspect into consideration. Um, it's uh, it's a, it's an interesting program. We we've, we've branched out into gold coins as well, and we're now doing type coins. Uh, we're not pushing it like crazy. You know, we're not trying to flood the market with them, but they are becoming uh, very very much widely accepted by um, the retail buyer from uh, the websites that they visit. Okay, cool. So let's uh, let's move on, on to the next date. We have here an 1881 uh, CC. Uh, we'll put this in front of the thing. And uh, we have, uh, the thing about the 1881 CC is uh, you have a mintage of 296,000. So this is gonna be the second lowest mintage of all CC dollars. Um, interesting, uh, 147,411, that's almost half of the entire mintage, uh, was sold at the GSA sales. Uh, so that, that makes the coin relatively plentiful, uh, I guess numismatically speaking. Um, PCGS is graded 28,497. NGC is graded 26,530. So that's a combined certified population uh, from those two companies of 55,027, uh, more than a third of what was sold at the GSA sales, but 18.6% uh, of the total mintage of this 140 plus year old coin is in a slab, uh, which is incredible. Uh, this uh, coin, we were talking about MS68s on the uh, 79S, which I, in my opinion, 154 is relatively plentiful for Morgan Dollar at that high, high level. Um, this this coin this coin is uh, is I, I would say the word conditionally rare uh, at MS68. Uh, the pop, uh, at least in the PC holder, is uh, five, and it's held it's held for several years at that level. Um, I would say 63, and we also have the CNGC coin. We'll put them side by side here. Um, in my opinion, 63 is kind of, uh, what would you say, Russ? Is this kind of on the, a little bit, the 
upper high average of what you would expect a, a GSA, run-of-the-mill GSA holder coin to be uh, when it was sold at the uh, GSA sales? I, I would agree with you. Uh, in the GSA holder. Um, outside of the GSA holder, like the coins that you're showing on your screen, um, I would think that 63 is more lower end. Uh, and it's. I think they're, they're targeted by buyers who are trying to put together maybe a consistently graded MS-63 set. Mm -hmm. Because the 89 Carson City and the 93 Carson City in MS-63, although quite expensive, are still attainable. When you jump to that 64 grade, then it gets a little bit uh, tougher and it's probably uh, not financially feasible for most market participants. So uh, I'm going to let the, uh, I'm sure at this point, seeing both of these coins side by side, that the people viewing this uh, program have already made their decision about <laughs> which of these two they like better. What do you think? Which, which of these two do you like better? Uh, well, under seven, under the, for the PCGS coin, um, under seven uh, X power, which when I, when I uh, looked at it before, um, I saw a myriad of contact marks on the mo most obvious area of the coin on the face of Lady Liberty. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's my personal opinion, but I kind of like to see a baby butt smooth cheek. Right. right? I'm all about that. That's you know, a focal point. Is the first, yeah. Exactly. It's it's where your eye always goes to. And um, this is very distracting. In a way, it's technically graded correctly. Uh, it's not an MS-61 or two, but it, it's it, it's not major. But, you know, I'd just as soon wait and not buy this coin and wait for something that is more appropriate, maybe has some contact marks hidden within the devices, let's say uh, Lady Liberty's hair or something like that. Um, it still has a decent amount of contrast between the fields and the devices. Uh, and that's the same with the reverse. Um, I find interestingly that the reverse is a full grade higher than the grade that they have on the insert of MS-63. Um, for the NGC coin, there's not as much contrast as the PCGS. There are slide marks over the face of Lady Liberty that, you know, kind of this thing that looking at it again under magnification, two bag marks below the eye. Uh, and there are marks across the breast of the eagle. So there's a slight discoloration. Mm -hmm. To be quite honest with you, I probably wouldn't buy either one of them. <laughs> I would wait. Yeah, to me, that, but I use that. Yeah, to me, that PC, that PC coin is and, and like once it's in a 63 holder, it is what it is. Right. I mean, there's no mystery anymore. Right. But if you if you had these both of these coins, you went to your local coin shop and they had they had a box of GSA slab coins and you're looking through them. Right. I would look at that coin. And I'm like and I would I would look at it for more than I would look at the other the NGC coin. And I would be looking at it and looking at it and then I'd be saying, well, that's a damn shame because like that contrast, that contrast does draw your attention that like when you look yeah. at this thing and under light, it, there's a lot of like luster there. This obviously was struck with the earlier die state um, uh, and the coin would have been nice were it not for all those contact marks. That amount of time it was in the bag being moved around carelessly by mint workers. Uh, but but also, um, I don't know if this coin would have looked like this in that GSA holder because I think this coin's been dipped because this is very vivid black and white on this coin. And if it was in a bag for over 100 years, I don't know if it would stay that color. That's a that's a that's a hunch on my part. What do you think about that? Well, I would agree with you. Um, but also, too, you know, one thing that we're not covering is value. Mm -hmm. OK, the. The 1881 Carson City and the 85 Carson City are sort of those semi-key dates that you have to buy if you're putting a set together. Um, they, uh, they're more rare and more expensive than the 82, 83, and 84 Carson City emissions. Um, but the trading range is very tight for the 81 Carson City in 63 grade, and it's okay to make a mistake. Um, give you an idea, the last 25 auction records the high has been eight hundred and ten dollars. The average is six ninety, and the low is six hundred. So you know what? You might be paying 
60, 80, a hundred dollars to own the coin and make a mistake, but it's not the end of the world. Right. And what I found is that even after 40 years, I'm still learning. And the only way I learn really well is by buying something and learning from my mistakes. I mean, I think we can all agree that that's one of the better ways of learning anything, but well, if you I mean, look at it, there's hardly there's not there's not much downside risk to buying a coin that that looks like this PCT just coin or this NGC coin, especially if you're going to trade it up for another one later on, you're going to maybe pay, you know, 50 bucks to own it, but then you're going to get a nicer one. Right. And if you only have if you only take a 10 percent haircut on a mistake on a numismatic yeah. coin, you're you're not doing bad. It's why it's it's why I think that there are a lot of people coming into uh, coins right now, you know, from like the stock market and things like that. We're seeing an amazing amount of new, fresh faces coming in, divesting themselves of some of the stocks that they're they've been happy to own and now looking for something else. So, like, let's talk about this, this mintage here and these Carson City coins. I mean, you know, back back in the day, um, uh, many in the numismatic community were afraid that the government or the treasury, I guess, uh, selling uh, its stockpile of these CC coins was going to tank the market. Um, they th <clears throat> they thought the same thing when the Redfield hoard came out. They said the same thing when the Continental Bank hoard came out, and the Lincoln Highway hoard, and you name whatever hoard anybody marketing uh, the came Binion, up with, the right? Binion hoard. The Binion hoard. <laughs> But the fact is, is that the morning dollar market just kept kicking and kicking and kicking. And I think it's the allure of Carson City, which is like one of those, it's one of those rare obscure mints that the coins for, for enough uh, of, the, of, the, of the output is still collectible. You know, yeah. Charlotte and Dahlonega are more obscure, but also harder to find coins uh, and, and, right. and especially gold. Carson City, uh, some of the gold coins are, are available, but the, the, they just have such a connection to the Morgan dollars because of yeah. those GSA sales. <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me, that their popularity um, it, it, it is always going to be there, and and with the coin market being as 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 strong as it's been in the last few years, I have to imagine that there's been a lot of interest. And these these CC mint Morgans, even though, as we said, here's a mintage seems low, two hundred ninety six thousand coins, but there's like fifty five thousand of them in slabs, and and one hundred fifty thousand of them were sold by the GSA, so they're out there, but but the, they 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 are more popular than they're available. I think you're right. I mean, you have the that Wild West kind of uh, lure of the Carson City. Um, the mint still stands, so you can actually visit it if you're ever in the area. Um, if you're an airline pilot or a banker or a chef or a professional athlete, um, you know, you can rely upon a dealer to find you a nice coin and you can have fun with it. You know, it's not like, as you mentioned, the Charlotte and Dahlonega coins where it can be a real uh, hair puller to try and find an 1861 Dahlonega mint anything. And then, you know, just come up frustrated. This is a very easy series to to uh, to complete. Uh, and one, of, you know, there are a lot of books on the subject. The most recent one, I think, was done by Adam Crum. Mm -hmm. uh, and he it's a small little book and you can read about it. And he gives you a good perspective on what to expect. And it's a great, uh, a great guide as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I think that uh, things like that are there and it's a good, also it's a good entry into the market too. Let's move on to the 1882S. This is the, the yep. next stack of Morgans we have here. Now, here, here's a very interesting uh, coin um, you sent um, and I hope the uh, color is picked up by the camera and the lighting because uh, color is one of those things where you, you kind of have to slightly rotate or wobble the coin to get it just right in the flat two-dimensional kind of thing but you can see if I just move the coin so that the reverse of this coin has a pleasing tone I wouldn't call this a, a super stunning toner but this is definitely above average blues on the left side some magentas going into gold and green uh, on the reverse 
And then when you look at the obverse, well, it didn't come into contact with the sac, and therefore it was protected, it's white. and it's white. Yep. So, so this isn't a coin where someone only dipped one side and forgot to dip the other. Uh, no, they, they no, came, no, no. Came, came out this way. <laughs> no, you know what? Also, too, um, uh, these brilliant uncirculated dollars uh, before their, the market increase over the past couple of years uh, were often found in tubes of 20 mm -hmm. rolls. Uh, and if the roll at the at either end of the roll, you had something on top of the coin protecting it, maybe like a piece of cardboard or a, a, a tissue or something like that, it would tone the top of that coin. Right. But it would not tone the other side. So do you think this was a roll? So you think this is probably roll toning and not like bag toning? It, it could very well have been. Okay. So... Um, a little bit of rundown on the 82s and here's the other one you sent and we'll have an obverse reverse view uh one's a 64 plus as you can tell with that toning another one is a, the other one is a superb gem at ms67 so uh again with the 82s this is again i, I mentioned before the 81s is the the rolls royce of uh morgan dollars as far as like general quality uh 70 uh 79s are good 82s are still good uh, as we get further into the Morgan Dollar series, the quality of the uh, S Mint coins that, that survive declines. But I think that's in large part due to the fact that most of the ones that survived were from the early years. Because eventually what happens is the San Francisco Mint runs out of room to store these things. So their mintages go down and the number of coins that per, that survive the uh, the meltings and the uh, the sporadic distributions goes down. So numismatists have a, a, like fewer opportunities to save these high state of preservation coins. But when we're in the 18, late 1870s, early 1880s, the San Francisco Mint is producing the flashiest Morgan dollars of all of the mints. Um, it's yeah. a state of the art facility at this point. So you have 9.25 million coins struck by San Francisco, 95, or I'm sorry, 94,577 graded by PCGS, 90,950 graded by AGC. So that's a combined certified population of 185,527 coins. So if you want to collect coins and you want an 1882 S Morgan dollar, there's a coin out there for you, for sure, in a, in a certified holder. Uh, a large number of these coins were released uh, by the treasury. But um, so that means that throughout the 60s, these were plentiful. Why why would somebody look at either of these coins and say, despite that mintage, despite 185,000 coins and holders, that these are coins that are that I should buy and pay premium for? Well, it's all about the look. Right. Um, and 82S, you know, we put together uh, 20... Uh, 30 and 50 coin sets of different dates and denominations. And by far, like the 82S seems to be a more difficult coin to find to include in those sets than the 79, 80 or 81S. I don't know why it is, but it tends to be much scarcer. Um, but it also has the same kind of, as you said, the, that blast, that cartwheel luster, the uh, almost the, the cameo contrast that um, that you would normally see on proof issues. Um, why is it more popular? I'm not really quite sure. I mean, it, again, you go to the, when you have the Carson City set building, you also can have the San Francisco set building. Mm -hmm. Although the, you know, you can, when you get to the 83 San Francisco and 84 San Francisco, those get prohibitively rare in higher grades and more expensive. And not to mention, uh, to, not to mention the 93, you know, which. Uh... <laughs> well, there you go, right. Um, that's why we don't put any of those coins in those sets. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, the looking at the value of this, um, right now it's, it, a PC just shows it at a thousand dollars, but uh, not, but a year ago it was at 775. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, pre pandemic uh, it was 675. Um, and the auction records, you know, I've told you uh, in the, when we discussed the 78 S that, auction records, the high, low, and average are indicative of the market move. Mm -hmm. um, the last 10 auction records for the MS67 now, 
the high is nine hundred and sixty dollars. Uh, the low is six hundred, and the average is eight hundred and twenty-two. Mm -hmm. So that's tending to go on the higher side, which shows me that the demand is actually uh, there for this particular coin. Interestingly enough, what shows me that the market is up and uh, as well as the graphics um, from PCGest.com is that the lowest low for the past 25 auction records, not the past 10, which was 600, the lowest 25 was $400. Mm -hmm. So it's the lowest low has gone from 400 to 600 dollars what a great investment that's been right 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 and and so on on, the, on these particular two coins i mean we'll we'll touch real quick on the toner yeah so so in this type of toning where where it's where it's uh one side only so let's let's maybe go with like the hypothesis that this would have been a in a, a roll toner is is that how how much less desirable would a coin like that be than maybe a coin that's toned on both sides? Or is a coin toned on both sides? Should that be like a provide like some alarm bells for a collector? Like how would a coin, coin vividly tone on both sides and not be uh, artificially toned by somebody using it, some chem some chemistry? Well, okay. Um, first of all, uh, you know the PC just will definitely call a coin or NGC also will call a coin um, artificially toned at the drop of a hat. Okay. Um, but they're being fair about it. And also if you, if you were to go for either the rare Koa green holder or the CAC endorsement on a coin that's been toned on both sides, you can be rest assured that that coin actually has toned on both sides. Now, how would it tone on both sides? It could have been uh, uh, put into a uh, container or a mint tray with velvet on one side mm -hmm. and maybe a, a velvet overlay on the other. You could also have um, the the uh, weight Raymond holders, which used to contain a slot for a one of, one of each denomination, even uh, also for all of the Morgan dollars with the sliding windows. That sulfur that was in the cardboard on each one of those holders would eventually bleed into the metal of the coin because it was so tightly uh, put in place that that would tone both sides as well. Um, toned on both sides definitely exists probably two in out of 10 uh, as opposed to coins toned on one side. And that's why they bring the big dollars. In fact, when I did the analysis for the MS67, I think there was an auction price realized of $4,500, but I threw it out as the highest high because it would have had toning on both sides. Right. Now, now a coin with toning on one side, if that toning is spectacular and it's been adjudicated, if you will, as being a legitimately toned coin, uh, those coins can bring moon money. I mean, we, we've seen numerous yep. high-end collections, specialized collections from, from connoisseurs who, yep. you know, those coins, you throw out the price guide, it's, do you like one that looks like it came from outer space? I mean, essentially at that point. Um, <laughs> so so um, let's look at the 67 and talk about this coin. So on the 67, this is a, you know, more or less a blast white example. And, uh, and it's got really nice luster from what I can see. Uh, it's got none of the uh, uh, blemishes on the cheek or uh, in the bus truncation or uh, in the fields and prominent uh, areas. Most of the contact marks, uh, such as they are, are concealed in devices, so they're not they're not uh, 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 obvious. Uh, is this what what do you think about buying at this level for this date? And and what is the quality of a coin like this, in your opinion, compared to other coins of the same grade? Um, well, I agree with you. This is an exquisite example. Um, it's got tremendous cartwheel luster. I mean, it, you, if you're a budding collector or a seasoned collector, it's one of these coins that you just can't stop looking at, you know, and that to me is, it deserves to be included in any kind of collection. Um, it can be a cornerstone to a, a small collection. It could be um, uh, the the average or par example for 
uh, sophisticated collection. Um, I'm, I'm hard pressed to find any imperfections. I think that the buy, buying coins like this, you really don't have much downside risk to it. Uh, if, and you know, you may pay a premium, but uh, with coins like this, I find that, you know, if you pay a premium for a, a desirable coin, the price is almost secondary because eventually the price will catch up to what you paid and surpass it. Right. And what, what does a coin need to say to you now I'm talking about Russ Augustine, the guy on the other side of the uh, counter, and I'm at the uh, A and A show trying to sell you my box of coins that I I moved on to a different collecting area. But what does a coin have to say to you at this MS67 level for you to give a strong price to it? Look at me. There's nothing wrong with me. Right. <laughs> Is it is it just that, or is it do you need to well, see some personality on a coin where you know that there's like maybe a few hundred or a, maybe a thousand of them graded, especially for like a popular series? The, to the as you said uh, when we began, the coin talks to you, right? Um, if I all of a sudden look at a coin and I'm looking really hard for imperfections and I can't find any, right? You know, that's a coin that I know is a keeper, right? So that's that the one I want. to so that's going to be a coin that you you can turn over and that's not going to sit there that somebody's going to say yeah oh that's a 67 now oh, it's like yeah you got anything else so that's that's basically what you're looking for <laughs> yeah no it's a coin that i'd be proud to put in the showcase and you know it takes a lot of effort to put coins up on the website you know you got to image them you got to crop them you've got to You've got to first of all, you got to select them. You got to be lucky enough to have a coin like that. Then you have to do a write up on them. We like to pick coins like that, right? To put up on the website because eventually, hopefully, we will get them back someday when the buyer decides to sell it, and hopefully, we're the first call that he makes or she makes. Yeah, I, I think with coin grading too, I think collectors have to realize this that um, coin grading is kind of on a spectrum. Like every grade has like a spectrum of possibilities. And obviously, yeah. as as professionals, we'd like to see there's more varieties of things that can happen to an MS62 Morgan dollar and it be accurately graded than an MS67. You really don't want to see like 55 possible maladies that can affect affect a coin and it still get a superb gem grade. But there are right. but there are differences like you can have like really great non-impaired surfaces but the strike is kind of you know mediocre or maybe it doesn't have that that contrast you know this coin has a nice booming contrast but but maybe it's just you know it's just sort of plain washed out looking and everything yeah. else can be great you know you can look at the coin under magnification and say okay well the cheeks are clean the the surfaces are clean there's really nothing i can complain about except it's a you know kind of coin and and that doesn't mean that that coin's not accurately graded, and it doesn't mean right. that that PQ one's undergraded either, because there, like I said, there is a range. But again, you're the buyer, and it's your money you're forking over. Yeah, it usually doesn't cut it, and and so that's why, you know, it does pay even at a high grade to know what you're looking at. Right, right, and also the other thing I like to think about is that the. The coin, for as long as it's been around, actually finds you. You don't find it. Right. You're the you're you're the you're the custodian. <laughs> right. So you know you you definitely the more exposure you have to the market and looking for coins like this, the better off you're going to be. It's like anything, like car hunting or house hunting. You know, if you spend six months trying to find one that speaks to you, you will find it. If you spend six hours looking for that, you probably won't be happy with it in the end. Yeah, and, and may, maybe maybe to put a finer point on that, buying a coin is kind of like buying a used car. Like if you want the new car, you're buying the uh, the silver eagle or the gold eagle from the mint, yep, right? They're right. all perfect. Right. So you're not going to go to your I don't know your BMW dealer and try eight different versions of the same color car with the same options to find the one that's the best one because it'd be very difficult in the yep. short amount of time you have. But if you're going to a used car lot because you're going to try to buy a vintage Corvette. You, you you know you don't typically hop into the first one you see and drive away with it and say I I did my research, <laughs> you know you so so a, a used coin is like any collectible anything that the state of preservation uh, is important but there 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 are factors beyond the surface that need to be understood. 
All right, so let's move on. Russ, we got the next coin on our list here is going to be another CC date. This is the 1883, and you've provided three coins here too. We'll look at them one at a time. I, I don't want to spoil the third coin until we get to it uh, because it's certainly in a different class um, than the, the first two. So here we have a PC65, and I'm going to ask... Uh, Owen here to put the uh, NGC one side by side, the second one. So that way we have the two side by side, uh, roughly equivalent uh, coins, uh, according to the two services. And uh, so let's uh, do a quick rundown of the 83cc. Uh, as uh, Russ mentioned earlier, the 83, 84 cc's are the more common uh, CC coins that were distributed. Uh, we do have a low mintage. This is 1,204,000. Uh, so it is... Uh, almost a million more than the 81 CC, but uh, the number that were uh, sold by the GSA is ex extraordinary. Of that 1.2 million, 758,000 were in the GSA sales. Uh, the final grouping of GSA 1883 CCs were sold by the government in 1980, and they were sold at $65 a coin. Uh, and the entire uh, allotment sold out within 10 days. Uh, the Morgan dollar market was definitely heating up at that po point. You have the uh, Hunt brothers buying a lot of silver. There's a lot of interest in, uh, in these uh, uh, precious metals coins. Um, there are also examples that sold at a lower price point, if you can believe it. They were sold in mixed date allotments, and those went for 45 bucks. So let's see. I did some quick calculations before we got on, Russ. Sixty five dollars in 1980 is roughly two hundred and thirty dollars today. So was buying an 1883 CC Morgan dollar sight unseen by the gut from the government in 1980. Was that a good deal? In a GSA holder? Yeah, in a GSA holder. I think so. So it's a great store of value. Right. Great store of wealth. You know, Robert Allen. Uh, in his uh, in his book on how to buy real estate going back decades, he devoted a whole chapter to rare coins. And the reason why he did that is because it's a great store of value. Mm -hmm. I agree with it. So you think you think that that was a good buy in 1980? Yeah. And so what would it what would what would a GSA a run in the mill 83 CC run you in today's market? Um. Okay, these particular coins in MS65... Which is not run-of-the-mill, folks. This is gem. This is definitely better than your typical GSA Morgan. Right. Well, yes. Um, so we have a published price right now of 650 um, And then the last uh, 25 auction records, we have a high of 720 a low of 504, this is for the past 25 auction records, and an average of 566 mm -hmm. for the PC Just coin. For NGC, the high is 720 also. The low, however, is 312. The average is 481. Shows me that people prefer PC Just over NGC for these particular coins. Um, however, if a coin has got great eye appeal, it's getting higher than the published price. If it's an average coin, it's probably getting maybe 10 or 20 percent back of that. So, I, I, you know, I respect the possibility that, you know, just based on where my light source is, that the uh, CC coin may appear, the, the NGC coin may appear a slight, a slight bit darker uh, than the, the, the PC coin. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the case, but I do think what you are seeing is that there is more reflectivity on the uh, PC coin. I think that it does have a more contrast between the device and the fields. But what, what was your take on these coins when you selected them for us to look at? Uh, well, as expected for the uh, Gem Brilliant Uncirculated MS65 grade, um, we see few blemishes. Um, the, uh, the eye is not easily drawn to one area or another uh, and is not arrested by an imperfection well i gotta admit russ on that on that pc coin i don't know if you can see it but there there's some scattered chatter 
uh, right below the E on uh, on the fields, and and to me that would that would really distract me. To be honest, I would I would see that and not be able to unsee it. On the reverse over on the reverse on the obverse, yeah, right in your on the obverse. Yeah, I mean okay. it's very faint, but but like uh, under light like this, I mean it's it's like I said, it's just chatter, you know. It's not. I, I noticed I noticed that you know uh, contact marks on the reverse field as well, but. Uh, you know, uh, only evident under seven power magnification. You know, the eye doesn't get drawn to that without the use of a, a loop. Mm -hmm. um, I actually found an imperfection on, on before the nose on Lady Liberty. Is that what you're pointing? Yeah, out? yeah, that's exactly. What I was like. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, I think that that that's definitely an eye catcher. Um, and will it affect desirability to some? Yes. Yeah. You know, they they want perfection at a certain price. And then on the NGC coin, to me, and this is like maybe for you too, a cardinal sin, you have that hit on the on the cheek. It looks like a cut, you know, like a scar uh, on the NGC coin too. So, I mean, uh, the, the, at MS65, you, you aren't going to get a flawless coin. I mean, we call it a gem, but right. you go buy a diamond and look at a diamond under magnification, you're going to see carbon in there. And, and, yep. and, and, uh, and so what, what type of issue with a coin in a gym level, uh, does the market seem to be more focused on? Is it that clean coin, but with a hit, a one hit, uh, on the cheek, or is it a coin that is, you know, got chatter in the fields? I wish I could, I wish I could, um, provide a, uh, a rifle shot answer to that. It's more like a shotgun blast, right? You know, it, 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 it's the coin speaking to you, you know, intuition, uh, to a large extent, uh, is involved in grading. When you, when you pick up a coin and you know, you're looking at it like this and you tilt it, the, you know, for me, the number pops in my head. Mm -hmm. I look at it, look at it back forth. I think most graders do that same thing. We, I, I did that and struggled at it prior to grading. You know, in 1986, grading came out. They made it easier, but, you know, 1986, I think they were more, far more um, strict on what the grading standards were. So, you know, not only did it make it easier, but then you had to evolve over time. But, there, um, you know, it coin speaks to you. Right. I'm going to go by your mantra. And uh, if you if it says, yes, this is the one for me, then, you know, it's, it's worth buying. What's your downside risk? Maybe 10 percent. Mm -hmm. And it, if you do buy the coin and later on you find you don't like it, you've learned a lesson. Right. But it's not a costly lesson. And then and then also context is important. I mean, let, let's just say in this situation that there's 67, 67 plus like really super jimmy coins with like yep. practically flawless if that's your standard um then uh, open the wallet and and pay for that standard if you're at right. this tier and you want a, a quality example that survives mostly intact with just light blemishes well then that's you know you're at a different price point and therefore you know you're gonna have to accept some compromise on that quality but that this just gets me back to again my that earlier point I made. I mean, it seems to me that you know the just the term gem when it was conceptualized meant highest quality, and I think I, I mean I, my personal opinion is that gem has become a middling, uncirculated grade for at least at least for series where there's enough abundant or there's an abundant amount of of, of material on the market to choose from when you have. You know, you may have a, 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 a Gobrek dollar where there's only three graded above a certain level and then Jim is Jim and that's just the end of the story. But when you do have thousands of examples of something, I think I think the term sort of does break down and because yep. there is that spectrum yep. of what's available. And when you again, I, I, no, no disrespect, I'm sure Toyota Camry is a great car. But but a Toyota camera sitting next to a Ferrari, they're, they're, they're not even the same like organism to me. It's like it's just a completely different thing. And then so when you have coins where you have that 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 
that's the wide array of, of possibilities. It's, it's easy to overlook a coin that's in an MS-65 holder because you have seen, you have seen better yep. and better yep. and better. Yep. And you know, what's interesting is that if I were to look at, if I were to put um, an 84O and an 84CC and an 84S all together, and I said the O is a gem, the CC is a gem, and the 84S is a gem, you'd be like, wait a minute, 84S is a gem? Right. I'm calling you on it. I don't believe you. Right, right. Because they just don't exist in gem. And as a result, you know, they're like hundreds of thousands of dollars in that grade. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so, so there's a different, it's a different approach. Yeah. And, 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 and for that buyer, that buyer who can buy that 84S in gem, assuming one ever comes around during their lifetime. Right. That, that buyer won't even look at your 1881S and 65. Because for that buyer... The only one that he wants to see is the MS-68 Plus that just got back from CAC that has color on it that he hasn't seen before, but he knew that uh, Jack Lee had it. Yep. And and so 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 again, when we talk about these these terms, I honestly feel like you have to be a little bit more uh, cognizant of the fact that maybe a gym for a date where gyms are scarce is 65. And, and, you know, this is not, you know, this is not gospel truth here, but, and, and then maybe for a date where 67, 68s are prevalent, then in my opinion, I would move that gym term up to 66, 67, that area that's yeah. closer to the top, because like in my, in my personal view of this, the market that you have to look at wh wh where that grade is when they start getting scarce and they are at the top end of what's available. And, and to me, like having having a grade that's like two or three grades beyond what is typically the investment grade coin. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of hard to call that a gym at that point. Right. Right. Well, the adjectives of, of, you know, brilliant uncirculated, nearly choice uncirculated, choice uncirculated, very choice gem, superb gem, where it was, uh, were emphasized by stacks prior to grading. Right. In their catalogs. Right. I mean, they were very consistent about that and you could almost, you'd almost take it to the bank that they knew what the numerical grade was, uh, even though they didn't quite use it. Um, but of course, that's been overshadowed now by the numerical grade. All right, so let's move on to another great date here. This is going to be the 1898 uh, New Orleans Mint. And, oh, wait a minute, I forgot one, Russ. I don't want to leave this one out. So we'll, we'll stick on the uh, CC. You forgot the dimple. Yeah, let's talk about this dimple. You went through the trouble of sending it to me. So, 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 um, and we'll take the other two off the screen. So the, the, the dimple stands for deep mirror proof like, and, yep. and this is the more, uh, 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 I would say that the, the richer of the two proof like designations, the other ones is called proof like. And when I was starting out, Russ, I, I did not understand this, uh, this concept because for me, so many of the dimples I had seen in auction catalogs or in person look like deep cameo proofs uh, in the sense that they had that black mirrored field and that frosty white uh, 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 device uh, and the contrast, contrast yeah. right? And so yeah. I didn't recognize until later that you can have a dimple without the cameo because what's being measured isn't the contrast, it's the reflectivity of the coin. And so, yeah. so a dimple reflects, uh, I don't know if it's, if it's eight inches or, or what it is, but it's, it's twice as much yeah, or twice as far. Kind of like one of these things, if I can... See the reflection, you know, that's what the dimple is. That's proof like. Right. Dimple proof like. So so yeah, and so and, and so that's what determines it. But obviously if you have a dimple in a high grade with that that rich cameo frosting on the devices and the mirrored fields, I mean those are gonna bring more money than a completely brilliant dimple. Am, am I correct in right. saying that? And, yes, and the population re records will reflect that. Right, and and then and then the other thing is, uh, and this is cr this is again crazy for people to, to 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 contemplate. But what would you rather have from an eye appeal standpoint, Russ? 
and, and I hope you answer the way I expect you to, uh, <laughs> a, 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 an MS-62 dimple or an, or an MS-62 that's like just a, br- a brilliant satiny uh, uncirculated coin. Which one is going to have the worst eye appeal of the two? <laughs> the dimple is. Right, because the mirrored fields are going to show it, it, everything, right? It's going to show everything. So it's so, like, you know, so it's, it's like a teenager's face. I mean, it's horrible. <laughs> right, right. So, so, so dimple is not necessarily an attribute that collectors should think signifies a better quality coin. It's an attribute that defines a characteristic of the coin. Yeah. And, and, and that characteristic can be, I mean, if, if all you have is like this pockmarked 62 dimple, because there's only three dimples known for the whole grade, maybe that's like gets a lot of people excited. If there's also very few proof likes, but if you have a 65 PL and a 62 dimple, the dimple is not really going to be the coin that this the connoisseur is going to go for. They're going to go for the sixty five PL, and and yeah. that that took well, that took me a little bit of, uh, of time to really contemplate because like I think about other you know like what, what's another coin that has like three attributes like the scent right so you have red red brown and brown, and so maybe someone takes a sixty four red early copper over a 66 red brown one because they want the red but that's not really like how dimples work so you have to think about it it's a completely different way of thinking about the um uh, this uh this attribute it's not like red red brown brown it's no it's well it's it's, it's certainly i mean the dimple gets better the higher the grade but i think that what happens with a dimple versus a, a non-dimple or a deep mirror proof like versus a proof like which is DPL versus PL, I think what you're going to do is you're you're going to find people focusing more in on the population data than the coin itself. The, the, here's a coin in a holder that has a population of four. Like I was offered a 1878S in a dimple 66 grade just this earlier this week. Um, the only reason I'm really looking at that coin is not necessarily the dimple characteristics. That comes second. It's the population data uh, and the price that comes first as to whether or not that's a good buy, because it certainly is the desirability of being one of four graded. Right. And, and, and when they're done, and like I said, when they're in a great state of preservation, they look great. I mean, a, yes. a dimple more than a dollar, it, it's, 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 it's almost like a quasi It's a sight to behold. Yeah. Yep. So, so what can you tell me about this particular example you sent? Now, of course, this is in a... Uh, older PCGS blue label when they still wrote the series and the coin on it. So this is probably from the mid to mid nineties. I'm going to guess when this was graded. Yeah. Well, um, it is not as desirable as you would think. Huh? Why is that? I mean, uh, well, well, let's put it this way. Let's let my, let my, uh, my, my very thoughtful and, uh, and interested client base say that, um, you know, after looking at it on the website for several months, you know, it's been up on the website for several months, but no one's bought it because I think of what we addressed earlier is that it just doesn't have that speak to me kind of pizzazz. Well, the reverse is really nice. But then again, like I've I've been told on good authority that um, the grading services consider the reverse to be roughly equivalent of one quarter of the overall quality of the coin and that the the reverse typically okay. is more protected and uh i've never heard that before but it would make sense it does yeah. make sense to yeah me. yeah and so oh. yeah and th- yeah this came from uh this came from a senior grader uh, actually these these senior grader and finalizer at uh, one of the services um okay who then went to be come that at another the other service so i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure that it's a consistent thing but yeah the the i appeal the money is on the the over so it's and yeah and and if you remember back way back in the day russ like when and when anax was doing the uh the the grading on the front and the back they would have 63 65 coins yep. and, and 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 the industry kind of moved away from it because you know, it's kind of yeah. hard to say, hey, this coin, the, the reverse of this coin is wonderful. And the obverse of this coin is slightly, lightly circulated. <laughs> just, well, yeah. No, I mean, yeah, those were Anax papers back then. They had a, a split grade 
And the only price guide that was in effect was the coin dealer newsletter, which started out with 60 and 65, then it included 63. So if you had a 63, 65 coin, you had to kind of look, I guess, between the two numbers to determine value. Right. And you, you know why difficult. You know why we got the 64 grade? You tell me. So so uh, John Highfill and all those silver national silver dollar roundtable guys. Yeah. This was at the height of the Morgan dollar market in the eighties. They yep. they wanted to make more money from, from coins that were like better than sixty three but couldn't earn sixty five. So they came okay. up with this sort of like intermediate grade of sixty four. So it could be like slightly more valuable than the sixty three, but not as valuable as the sixty five. And so that essentially like that opens the opens the floodgates to the uh, eleven point mint state system we have today. But yeah, I mean, this was this whole system we have, which we 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 look at it and we're like, oh, the Sheldon scale. It must go back to Doctor Doctor Sheldon. It's like, well, it it really was an ad hoc thing that sort of developed into what we have now, and and now now it's now it's a monster. <laughs> well, you know, um, even earlier than that, in the in the late seventies and eighties, New England rare coin galleries, uh, I think. Uh, under Jim Halpern, we're selling coins that graded 67, you know, and maybe even 69 once in a while. Right. So there was that that need. I don't know if I remember seeing 64, but I remember I remember it was interesting when it started up showing up on the gray sheet. Right. Right. And you can know, you can you imagine that 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 conundrum publishing a price guide and you you have the teletape and all this stuff going on and 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 the dealers are just kind of like figuring out how they want to describe these coins. I mean, it must have really been a, the Wild West. I, I totally agree with you. But you know what? There was al already there was that concept that this is better than a 63, but less than a 65. So if one's 100 and the other is 200, this is worth 150. Right. And, and, and I will say, the thing is, it, and, and I don't know, it, it's not, it's one of these chicken and egg things too, because although dealers kind of got together to codify the grading standard and auction houses had been describing coins a certain way. There were collectors out there like Waldo Newcomer, uh, like in the early 20th century, there are other collectors like him who are going for quality um, coins and who by today's standards would have had registry set quality collections. But when you're yeah. talking about Morgan dollars, I mean, even before Jack Lee, you had a guy like Wayne Miller who was going yeah. out there in you know, whatever gray sheet or red book or whatever had for Morgan dollars, he wasn't paying anything close to that. Uh, he was paying super premiums for super premium coins. And there were collectors like him that were going out there and they were basically creating what we would consider the modern Morgan dollar market. And they were defining what they wanted. And in some respects, the grades caught up with their tastes. And um, you're absolutely and, right. And then so you and because you, guys like Jack Lee and Wayne Miller, this was like back when they, they didn't have uh, slab coins necessarily to tell them everything. They had to, the coins had to speak to them and they had to be able to translate that to say, OK, well, this is a once in a lifetime coin or I've seen uh, 100 coins better than this. And so when they were building their sets back in the, the late 70s and early 80s, they didn't, they didn't have the benefit of what we have today. They can't they can't go to CoinFAQs and see every true view of every superb gem coin. They can't go to Heritage or Stax Bowers auction archives and see all that. They, they had to really do this like with shoe leather, going to coin conventions all across the country, being known as the guys who are paying buku dollars for these coins yep. so that dealers would say, hey, before I sell this uh 1893s to someone else uh, this Vermeil coin. I'm going to take it over to Jack or Wayne and see if they want to buy it. And and so this is this is kind of you know laid the foundation for what we have today. And uh, and so that like I said this with this uh, beautiful 83 CC, which for compared to the other two 65s we have, I, I believe I like this coin better. But but as 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 uh, Russ was saying. You know, I think you're you're asking almost fifteen hundred dollars for it, um, and that's that's a, that's certainly a, a stiff premium to the sixty five uh, regular um, uh, un, 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 un you know unproof like or whatever you want to call it the regular uncirculated sixty fives. Um, right. Well, they do have a market high of seventeen forty uh, with a market low of nine thirty, which happened in the pandemic. 
but an average of 1368. Right. So, right. All right. So let's move on, Russ. Let's, uh, we got, yep. we got some more, we, we still, believe it or not, we're past the halfway point, but we got a lot of coins to talk about here. All right. So that, so after this, uh, 83 CC, we have an 1898. Oh, so this will be the first Nolens mint coin we have in our, in our, in our stream here. And, uh, we'll center that coin for you. Um, this one has, uh, I like it. The uh, gold peripheral toning. Um, the New Orleans mint coins, to, to me, are probably consistently the worst struck flat yeah. uh, coins. Usually have like really diluted luster. Um, a lot of these, a lot of slidery coins in this, yeah. in this, uh, this uh, mint. Because I, I think what, what ended up happening... Um, and some uh, some numismatists before for me call them cup of coffee coins. That essentially, <laughs> essentially, what you would see is uh, 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 the coin would 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 uh, be struck in a treasury bag, distributed, get cut out, get circulated like for five seconds, but thrown back into a bag and thrown in a vault, and then show up in the 1950s or 60s when the there was a run on uh, 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 silver coins when the when we changed over. Uh, this this is not a cup of coffee coin. This is an uncirculated example, um, and it doesn't it doesn't have that flat um, that flatness that I usually see in these coins. So so in your opinion, is this this is an above average coin for the uh, for the for the issue? Well, um, coming back to the cheek, it does have some facial scratches. Sure. But it is a 63 coin, and it is accurately graded. Um, the normal trading range right now is between 66 and $73 for this coin. Uh, it's a coin that is a common date, 1898 mm -hmm. Um I think perfectionists will actually look for a well-struck hair over the ear, right? as they do with all New Orleans Mint coins, and that can vary. Um, and really, uh, supreme coins in this grade can bring as high as a hundred dollars. Yeah, when I was talking about quality for the grade, I was really looking at that strike. Uh, obviously, the, the the hits and everything are there. Um, yep. But but this does seem like, in my opinion, a stronger strike for the issue than uh, it will be typical for a for a sixty three. Right. Well, you have a high relief on these coins anyway. You know, so uh, I have seen coins coming out of rolls, not necessarily original rolls, but made up rolls that all look the same and they have a flatness and weakness in the strike. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's one of those things that uh, well-versed collectors will begin to notice and then uh, I dare say fixate on right. when, they're, when they're searching for coins to include in their collection. I've heard that sometimes raw coins come in if they're out of bags. And they'll still have like sawdust on them when they when they go to the grading services. And then sometimes I have to kind of like use like, I don't know, some sort of like stylus or Q-tip or something to kind of remove it. Uh, because, you know, they well, however these compressed air. Yeah. However, <laughs> however, these things are stored, um, yeah. you know, they they took on all sorts of like uh, external uh, uh, debris. Um, yeah, I didn't mention the uh, I didn't mention the uh, grading numbers on this. I think it's again. I, I just uh, think it's important for people to realize that you know uh, there there's a lot of uh, a lot of material that's graded in the market, and and you have the opportunity to get the coin that's right for you. You don't have to you don't have to snap at the first one. Um, right. Let's go. But this peripheral toning on this coin is really exquisite. Right. And, you know, I also think that that was that's a classic example of. Coming out of an album, a Wait Raymond album. Wait Raymond album, yeah. So the yeah. Uh, basically the sulfur and the page is turned yep. the rims, and and you can also tell if this is going to be genuine uh, toning and not you know you know artificially toned if the uh, reeds because uh, they would have also been in contact with the paper the the reeds would have also turned that color. Right. All right. So right. Let's, good point. Let's move on to the uh, the next coin here which is going to be another New Orleans Mint uh, coin. And this is uh, the 1902 O. And, and here's, a, here's another example where we'll, we'll have to move this around. 
so you can see the toning on this coin. And, uh, it, and uh, Owen, if you have the ability to kind of do that while we talk here, um, you can see the, the Averses coin has blue, purple, uh, gold toning in the fields, as like sort of spots. I wouldn't necessarily call it spots, uh, but there are multiple little areas of that toning. And let's look blotchy. at blotchy, right? <laughs> and let's look at the reverse of this coin. And uh, you see just a faint, faint amount of color along the rim, but most, mostly, I would, I would say mostly brilliant with a light, light haze on it. So we'll, we'll go back to the obverse. So what, 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 what's your opinion on a coin like this? This is a coin that uh, Rarecoa has approved for its green label program. Okay. All right. Um, not everybody will like the toning, but this is as original as it gets. Mm -hmm. um, but how did it get created this way? I mean, it's, I think that it was um, likely stored on some sort of paper, but it also, that paper could have become moist at some point in time. And so what you have is this blotchiness that's going on. Right. But it's very unusual. There are minor contact marks and, you know, to an aficionado, you know, this is, this is a, this is definitely a stopper. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you're looking in a showcase at a coin show and you're seeing one white coin after another, and all of a sudden you see this one, you stop and you pay attention. Right. And so, so what would you say, like, what would the, the cost differential be for a coin with this degree of toning versus, you know, uh, a run of the mill 19020? Uh, well, okay, the um, the MS64 value, published value is 155 right? Uh, for PC Jets. And I'm just using that as a rule of thumb. I'm not endorsing it one way or over another. Um, a 64 plus is 180, a 65 is 275, and a 65 plus is three and a quarter. Um, this is a 200 to $225 coin. So not quite making the full jump to 65. But in the conversation, no, I would pay. I would pay two hundred and twenty-five dollars for this coin. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And this would also be the kind of coin that if I came to you and said, you know, I, I've I, I've upgraded this coin, <clears throat> I'd like to I, I'd like to sell to you. You're not necessarily going to gray sheet and offering ten percent back a bid on it either. Uh, you know, there are some people who probably would do that. You know, if they have to, you know, pay for the brick and mortar. Um, and I could also see that some people don't like the toning and therefore they would only think that it's worth 90% uh, of gray sheet bid. Right. Um, however, if you look at them long and hard enough, you realize that something like this is one out of a thousand. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. So the next coin on our list is going to be another New Orleans coin. This is the last New Orleans coin uh, in the uh, Morgan Dollar series. I think, and uh, this is the 19040. Uh, mintage is 3,720,000. Uh, P suggests is graded 141,486 of these. NGC 82,521. So that's a combined. Uh, that's a combined. Po well, actually, that that NGC number may not be right. I might have um, made a mistake on that. Uh, let me see here if I have that pulled up. I don't. Well, suffice it to say, um, if my number is not correct, uh, NGC has graded a significant number of these coins. Um, my, my total calculation was 4.3% of the total mintage was graded. Um, this is a conditionally scarce coin in mint state 67. So you're going to be able to get them in 64, 65, and some in 66 uh, without having to go to like a, you know, a major auction. Um, but 64 is the most common grade. Um, and there's, there's probably over a uh, hundred thousand, uh, at each uh, grading service, uh, 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 in this grade. So obviously as the last year of the New Orleans mint in the series, that's going to have like some cash, uh, uh, with collectors. Um, but what, what do you think about this grade for the state? Is this a good is this good, a good collector or investor grade for the Morgan dollar? Well, um, despite the toning, um, 
you know, the uh, the buy sell range for a non toned coin being eighty seven to ninety six dollars for a toned coin. And I got I went to great collections for this price analysis. It's actually the average range is ninety five to one oh six. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, if you can buy a tone coin like this, you know, at the eighty seven to ninety six dollar level, I think it's a great buy, you know, but these coins, because of the uh, the supply demand issue, you're um, when all of when the when the when the Morgan dollar market in sixty four grade goes up, so does this coin. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily going to go up on its own, right? So what you're doing is you're either buying into the silver market with a little bit of oomph, um, or you're just investing in Morgan dollars. Period. Right. It's not necessarily like the uh, the 1904 S, which is a much rarer coin, worth ten times the amount, where you actually have a supply demand issue coming into play that will influence the the market value of that coin over time, right? So, so we got one more coin in the Morgan series we'll touch on. Then we're going to switch gears to talk about some peace dollars. Uh, we don't have as many peace dollars because uh, uh, we're, we're really going to focus on, uh, on on some type coins and also the 21, which I think is a great a great year. To talk well, the about. 21 Denver Mint, I think that I also sent to you, just as a side note, you know, that's the only, that's 101 years old now. Right. But it's also a, a, the only Denver Mint coin in the for the series. Morgan Dollar series, so I think that that's kind of interesting, too. Yeah. So, so uh, the uh, the Mintix here, I mean, compared to other, uh, there there are more twenty ones struck than uh, than than the market knows what to do with, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but there are twenty million three hundred forty five thousand twenty one D coins struck, and there's actually a little bit of a paradox here, uh, I think, uh, because. Uh, uh, with that huge mintage, con- considering how we have coins uh, like from some of the CC mints with a bunch lower mintages and higher certified populations, I-, I was I was not necessarily surprised to see it, but the collectors may be surprised to know that uh, the combined certified population of 21 D Morgan dollars is only 47,040 coins at the present time, which means that. Uh, there are fewer of these in holders than there are uh, in the in the uh, uncirculated market space by comparison. Um, and, yeah. and one of the reasons for this is that, you know, up until third party grading uh, really took over the market, dealers would essentially reject the 21 Morgan dollars. Um, there were just too many of them. They, they didn't have the appeal of the 19th century issues. Um, and, uh, you know, and the strike was awful. The strike was <laughs> awful. Well, they had to create completely new hubs and, and yeah. uh, for this because, because, you know, such a amount of time had elapsed. Um, and so, so they really sort of like, you know, in some respects, you can look at them as replica Morgan dollars, even though they were official yeah. issues. Um, yeah. and, and so, and this, this particular, uh, issue, I would say the 21 planes, that's the Philadelphia mint mark would be the lowest on my priority list. The D yep. and the S mints, however, uh, are tougher to find gem. Yep. And and so when you get a nice one, like it's, I, I definitely would consider that uh, if I was just buying, if I, if I had a list of maybe I could only afford 10 or 15 coins in the series and the, the 21s came up because maybe you want that 1878, that first year of issue and you want the book end it with the last year of issue. I would look at the 21 D's or the 21 S's first. And as Russ mentioned, this is the only Denver Mint issue in the entire series. So so maybe that gives you some extra oomph there. And the interesting thing here, with Russ, to me is um, there's only a small jump in price from 64 to 65. And then there's, you know, maybe a 50% jump to 66. So where where do you fall on like what is the grade that you think you would advise a client to look at because of you know if the, if there's only like a seventy five dollar jump between a four and a five I mean is is it worth going to that five if it's only if it's only marginally more expensive? Well, um, something's up with this issue. Um, between. Uh, 
over the let's say over the last twelve months, the uh, the market value um, has gone up from like fifty almost to a hundred percent. Wow! In you know in grades uh, two, three, four, and possibly five. Um, and I think that you know it's ripe for promotion as the only Denver Mint coin, um, and as well as you know just passing the one hundredth anniversary. And also, if you um, watch the the news networks, the they every every so often you have a bullion ad, but now you're starting to see the 2021 uh, Morgan dollar and piece uh, Morgan dollar being offered for sale. Right. So you know, there's um I think that there's a an unusual timing aspect to this um, that's going on. I mean, to give you some idea, the the highest high, I'm sorry, the averages for the MS64 coin have jumped from 254 to $329. Mm-hmm. The low has jumped from 126 to 252 right. over the past 10 auction appearances. So the, the low of the past 10 auction appearances is equal to that of the average of the last 25 auction appearances. Something's up. So do you think okay. you, you think that perhaps the centennial of the release of the the last Morgan and the first piece dollar coinciding yep. with the sale of the mints tribute coins of 2021 may may have allowed or not instead but primed the pump let's just say for yep. for the general public to be active in this date where maybe in the past that wasn't the case that and being the only Denver Mint in issue, mm-hmm. I, you know, um, it's a requirement for almost every collector who's kind of aware of that sort of thing to have one of each mint. Right. All right. So let's. Uh, that's that's a good good chat. And so overall, you would say that the Morgan dollar market has been very strong in the past six months or so. Oh gosh, yes. I mean, it it really took a jump right after we got out of the pandemic uh, early months. Uh, starting in the fall of 2020, and and more particularly in the um, first and second quarters of 2021, the market really took a jump. And um, I know that because I'm sitting at a desk in a building where a lot of the buying was done by the traders at Rarecoa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that... and that and these and these. I sorry to interrupt you, but these these traders also are publishing active buy and sell prices, which means that you know they're putting their money where their mouth is. So. Not only are they influencing the market, but they're they're supporting it, and it's a dynamic market, and it's a, a broad based market. So, I think it's a good place to be right now. And, and would you say a similar 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 facts uh, hold true for the Peace Dollar series? Yes, um, to a lesser extent. Okay, and that's that's almost always been the case. The Peace Dollar has sort of been the the step the step brother of the morning dollar series and right and and again i i think part of that's just the allure of the 19th century coin versus the 20th century coin um yep. we don't think of the morning dollars the 20th century coin although it was and yep. and the peace dollar had a shorter run and it's it's a it's a little bit more idiosyncratic and well with 24 coins in the series actually that's a that's a far easier target to buy one of each coin and you know, you only have a problem with the 1928 and 34S issues when it comes to expense. Uh, and now even the 1921 issue, which I think we're about to cover, it went up in value because of the centennial. Right. And and, and we're going to look at the 21s now. So the 21 issue, in my opinion, is one of those coins where um, I think the average collector probably can't afford this coin and probably hasn't been able to afford it for a while. Uh, and I mean by, you know, this is like your local coin club guy, you know, who, who probably can spend, a, you know, a hundred or $200 on a coin every now and then. But, but the 21 has, has been a key, a key of the series for a while uh, because of the high relief um, the mintage was, was relatively low. It was 1,006,473 coins. Um, to, to put in perspective, why is there a 21 Morgan and a 21 piece and that there's way more piece or Morgan dollars and peace dollars? Well, that's because production of the peace dollar did not begin 
uh, until late December of 1921. The legislation to authorize the change in design was introduced into to Congress uh, in May 1921, but the design that you see here wasn't approved until December 19th. So the Mint made as many as they could in the amount of time they had remaining. The coins were released to circulation in, in probably around January of 2022. And uh, the Wall Street Journal called the coin the flapper dollar uh, based on the flapper dancers of the time. <laughs> and um, uh, the ANA pilloried this design uh, in the February 1922 issue, The Numismatist. Uh, they actually took it pretty personally because uh, the ANA's, you know, leading members had this idea for a coin to, to, to sort of mark the end of World War I, to honor peace, you know, the yep. peace that the peace to end all peace, I guess, is what it really was, uh, because, you know, 15 years or so later, we're getting into World War Two. But they wanted a peace dollar. And the, the government, as it normally does, takes an idea, turns it into some Frankenstein's monster version of it. And you end up with a coin that like the ANA felt like they should have picked the design, not the secretary of the Treasury. So that uh, honestly, there's a little bit of narcissism there. Um, over time, I think opinions on the coin have softened. Um, I like its I like its design. Uh, it's certainly an advance in sculpting over the Morgan design. Uh, yep. it, it's uh, uh, when done well, uh, uh, when or preserved well, a peace dollar can be a really gorgeous coin. Uh, yep. When not, it will show it will show a lot of hits. So we have here two coins that could not be as diametrically opposed in the same grade. <laughs> uh, and so th this is, I mean, obviously this is no coincidence, but uh, on the NGC side, you have a brilliant uh, satiny looking 21 piece dollar with uh, as much of that relief struck up as was uh, permissible uh, given the fact that the mint was trying to make money, not pieces of art. And the, uh, the PCGS coin is got very, very subdued luster, if if any at all, underneath this layer of uh, this uh, this layer of um, uh, surface uh, haziness, or uh, I guess you could say it's patina. I'll go with that. Yeah, and um, you know, and they're both they're both you know uncirculated for sure. There's they're not. One coin's not overgraded, one coin's not undergraded, but they are completely different and they are treated completely differently by the market. So go like run this down. What's the what's the expert analysis of these two coins? Well, uh I thought it was an interesting study in um the 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 old PCGS versus NGC for especially for silver dollars, that you can't necessarily say that you're going to always get a, a better coin in one holder or the other. Okay. Okay. Um, and also you're, you're not going to, you're going to pay for what, uh, what you get. In this particular case, the PCGS is worth 20% less than the NGC. Right. And I can sort of see why. I mean, very easily. It's, it's light and dark. Right. Um, which one would you want to own? You know, it's like, I, you know, if you're spending money, make sure you're getting a coin that you like. And that PC just coin, just because it's in a PC just holder doesn't necessarily mean it's the night, the nicest coin that's available. And by all means, don't get fooled into buying a poorly presented coin or one that hasn't been preserved well and paying the money for a coin that, has been preserved well, that is brilliant on circulated like the NGC. I, I also, Russ, I don't think, and, and again, I, I mean, I'm going to defer to, to your experience over mine. My, my gut tells me here that you could not dip that PC coin and make it look like the NGC coin. I just don't know if there's enough luster left on the surface of that coin to make it look uh, presentable if it was, if it was processed. Do you, do you think that's... I agree with you. Yeah. So, I agree with you. 
So, so in that case, like the PCGS coin is presented probably in the optimal way that particular example could be presented, and that it is, it is not gonna. It's probably not gonna CAC, and it's and it's also probably not. You know, this isn't a coin that would ever upgrade. This is what it is forever. Right, <laughs> right, right. Now it, the the trend is definitely up on this coin. Right. Um, you know, I've done an analysis uh, for auction records averages uh, for both PCGS and NGC. Um, so if if all things were equal, uh, you know, this coin in 64 grade um, has had a tremendous track record. I mean, if you go back to pre-pandemic uh, and uh, just at the beginning of January 2021, which is when it was 100 years old, uh, its published price was seven hundred to nine hundred dollars. Right. And now the published price is two thousand. Right. Um, however, with the average of auction records, I would look at the this, the PCGS coin, this particular coin, worth more on the low end than the average. Right. Definitely not on the high end. But the NGC, I would look at the, the opposite is true. I would not necessarily look at the low end. I look at the high end versus the average. Right, and and I didn't remove your sticker, but I think I think that that's probably a fourteen hundred fifty dollar rare color price on that on that PC coin. Um, right. If I'm not, and the the average is fifteen hundred and seventy two dollars for the last twenty five auction records, and sixteen hundred and seventy five for the last ten auction records. So it's actually well below the average. So, tr- so, tr- so truthfully speaking, though, and uh, like I said, I'm not trying to get you to to denigrate, you know, the the coin more than but would you say that it's a good buy at that price or would you caution people to say listen there there are nice coins available for not much more and the bargain isn't necessarily the best option for you yes i would definitely counsel that if it were a dealer who's a buy you know buying and selling and trading um, I would say, look, you could probably make $100 on this coin because the the lowest low for the past 10 auction appearances is $15.60. Right. Yet I'm willing to sell it for a $50 profit at $14.50. Right. You know, I really don't want to place a collector in this coin. So I would urge him to step up, pay a little extra money for a brighter, whiter coin, which will be far more liquid in the future. It's all about, you know, Yes, how much you pay for it, but then it's what's going to happen when you want to liquidate this coin. Right. And, and I'll even put it this way. Like the coin market works in cycles, guys. And so we may be in a, I mean, honestly, I think the market right now is kind of at a, a plateau. Uh, it, it's it's still good, definitely good, but it's not like like going up like it was after the, when the pandemic started. One of the reasons I think that the it went up as sharply as it did is because uh, the numismatic industry was prepared. We had a lot of ability to sell coins without having the conventions. And and the second thing is, uh, we had not fully recovered the prices that we had experienced in the 2013-2014 boom market. We were still at a depressed price point after that recession in numismatic marketplace. So so we saw we saw like strength in the numismatic market. Because people were diversifying, they're putting things into different collectible classes or uh, 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 investment classes, and 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 we had a lot of room to go up. Um, the market may not always be this hot, and in that situation, you don't want to have a box filled with subpar coins when you have to go to a, a dealer and say, uh, "I'm ready to get out of my collection. Uh, here's 20 subpar coins." Because in a tough market, the dealer wants, I mean, they, they want to maybe in a good market, they're turning their inventory over five or six times a year. In a tougher market, yep. maybe it's three or four times a year. And they're going to look at that coin and say, is this going to, am I going to hold this coin and have capital in it for two years? Or yep. is this coin going to move no matter what the market condition is? And so getting back to these two examples, and we'll flip them over one more time, it's not even debatable which of these two coins a dealer is going to want to buy in a tough market right right 
All right, so let's move over to this uh, 22. This is now we're starting to get into some of these common date uh, Morgan or peace dollars. And um, these are, you know, because because they're very plentiful, they're, they're heavily marketed. Uh, and the examples we have here are all gems. And this is, in my opinion, where you want to be in peace dollars, especially for type coins. You don't you don't need to bother with anything below 65 because there's always a 65 available, but not all 65s are the same. I agree. Uh, so, so one of the differences here is uh, the relief is lowered. You know, the men is now able to mass produce these uh, and get most of the detail uh, imparted on the coin. Uh, so this coin looks like it has more detail, actually, in my opinion, than the high relief 21s, but the relief is lowered and that's why it appears that you see the detail. Uh, and if you had the coins and you measured them, you, you would be able to see that the uh, the relief is, is different. It's it's very obvious in hand. So what can you tell me about this example you picked? Which um, which one? What's this, the last yeah, four this, digits? This is the 22. That's uh, 4005. Okay. Um, I found that it had very good satiny luster. Mm -hmm. um, there were several marks on the cheek which disturbed that luster, but they really didn't create too much of a problem. Yeah, you can see that. Um, the reverse has some problems, however. Um, and uh, it may be that NGC may have missed. Oh, wait a minute. We're talking about the, yes, we're yeah, talking about the point. Yep. Yeah. Um, it has a fine circular line bisecting the body of the eagle through the wing and up and through uh, the U and pluribus. Is that, is that, a, is that a, a, a wheel mark from a, counting machine or something it could have been but yeah i mean it's entirely possible mm -hmm. um but you know it's the luster kind of overrules on the marks right but it's you know you're investing in a coin that is a gem piece dollar in fact it's a type coin and therefore actually gets sold in packages of of 10 20 50 or 100 without even mentioning the date it's just a common date. So another another chestnut that this uh, senior grader uh, told me was that the reverse <laughs> can never help a coin. It can only hurt it. So in this in this case, would you say that this reverse hurts this coin because of that's that that curvilinear mark on the back? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't want it. <laughs> right. You don't want it. OK. No, I don't want it in my collection. So what what would what what kind of discount would a coin like this sell for over like you know your uh, your your you know a, a problem quote unquote problem problem free MS sixty five? Well, what will happen is that you know if it's in a in a showcase, uh, it'll sit there for a while until it gets discounted, till uh, until the prices make makes more sense than anything else. So, it's just product. So this is the kind of coin where someone grabs it out of your holder. And if they pause long enough, the uh, <laughs> the price you offer it might be a little bit lower than what's on the sticker. And they may not even, I mean, it might happen so fast that the buyer, potential buyer, and I'm looking at it like a dealer who's putting together a group of coins, may not even notice that circular wheel mark. Right. right. You know, they'll just put it in the group of, of items that they're purchasing and move on to the next one. All right. Well, let's say uh, we got two 23s here we're going to look at. And yep. These are the uh, the penultimate date in our stream. And again, I want to thank you, Russ. I I, I know I've uh, taken a lot of your time this morning. Um, no, it's been a, it's been fun. Okay, so uh, we have <coughs> excuse me two MS sixty fives here, uh, both brilliant, uncirculated, uh, both lustrous coins. Uh, one in your NGC green holder, and one in a PCGS, uh, what I call the blue fader holder. Which is their current their current holder for uh, standard tier, um, and uh, you know I can already see like you know the lights kind of shining out a little bit. There is a some contact mark. It looks like a contact mark in the bust uh, neck area of Liberty on the PC coin, uh, but it does yep. it does have you know the cheeks are relatively clean other than the bottom there the chin area. There's definitely a hit there, and um, I I've seen sixty sixes. Uh, graded that are crummier than this to be honest so the, well, I, I on the on the pc just coin i could actually call the reverse of 66. yeah and and then on the ngc coin um again 
this is probably plus luster, I would say, for the date. Um, for sure. And, and booming luster. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. That's what I called it. Yeah. So, so how, how similar are these coins like from a market perspective, in your opinion? Uh, there's a 20% difference in value. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the luster really separates the coin, the NGC green label coin from all the others. Um, you know, not often do you have cartwheel luster on peace dollars because of the method of manufacture. Uh -huh. But this one definitely has magnificent cartwheel luster. Right. Um, what keeps it from a 66 is probably the minor contact mark, I think, as you mentioned, uh, in the hair above the ear. Right. But otherwise, it's got a great appearance. You know, it's got that that nice cheek that 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 I like and that many, many other buyers do like. Um, there is uh, one downfall, and that's there's slight light water spotting on both the obverse and the reverse. But you really have to look at that and get it, uh, pick it up uh, under light. Yeah, I can kind of see it on the mound there a little bit. Um, yeah. The PC just has average luster, though. Right. I mean, it's there are three major bag marks on the neck, as you as you mentioned. They're all horizontal, and you know, I would for twenty percent premium, I'd much rather have the green label holder. I'm all, I'm also going to speculate here that that both coins have been dipped at some point, uh, and I think that the uh, and again that doesn't mean that the dipping has ruined the coins. If if a coin has this type of luster, uh, the dipping it I, I believe improves it. Uh, on the yep. on the PC coin, I I feel that this this coloration you see, especially on the reverse, tells me that this is an older. Uh, this this was dipped several years ago, and that's why it's sort of kind of developed a, this sort of light yellow patina. And I think I think I, I, you see this a lot, if I'm not mistaken. I think you're right. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me that you know uh, that the metal quality was probably uh, less or, or more poor, it was poor compared to you know the pre 1900 Morgan dollars. Mm -hmm. I think it's it, you notice that the metal quality might be the same in the 1921 Morgans as they are in the, some of the piece issues, especially from the Philadelphia Mint. Right. And what's the current market on these 23s? Uh, the last uh, 25 auction appearances, do you have um, a high of 372 and a low of 113 with an average of 186? Um, NGC is uh, higher, actually. The last um, 10, uh, 25 auction records, high of uh, 325, a low of 134, with an average of 190. Right. And so, so you would be surprised, like the market would bear about a 20% premium for the, the PQ example here. And, and if, if you had, a, how would that PQ example price point compared roughly to like what a 60 a run of the mill 66 would be i mean is that is that a close compare a close price spread there or is there a big jump no i think you're going to see similar i mean but the remember the the averages are like in the 180 to 190 range but the highs are three and a quarter to 375 right you know so i mean there's a huge jump there um i appeal with these coins is everything um and also uh, since toning doesn't uh, occur on the Peace Dollar series in general, um, any kind of toning that is attractive that is on a certified Peace Dollar tends to bring you know multiples of what it's what the uh, holder would say it's worth as just a white coin. Right. Yeah. It, se it seems to me that if I'm not mistaken, most of the toned uh, Peace Dollars I've seen on the market have been 22s for some reason. I don't know if that's just maybe I'm inventing this in my head or, or, or not, but, but I, I, I seem to recall that it's usually not 21s. It's usually not 28s. It's usually not 35 S's. It, it tends to be these, 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 uh, 22, it's 23. Yeah. It's 22s and 23s. Um, 24s less so, uh, than 26s, you know, I mean, less so, but definitely that run of, uh, Philadelphia mint coins, between 18, uh, 1922 and uh, 1926 have that sort of that, that common feel. Stored a long time, nobody wanted to use them. And that, that's 
pretty much, you know, they have thousands these, of bags, these sub yeah, sub thousands. subterranean treasury vault sub vaults. All right, last right, exactly last coin we have here is an MS sixty six. This is the quote unquote the nicest of the uh, uh, peace dollars that we're looking at of this uh, small allotment. Uh, this has a, a lower mintage than the twenty two and twenty three. It's it's still a fairly common date. Um, and uh, the mintage here is ten million one hundred and ninety eight thousand. And I want to bring that up because uh, this is a coin that is heavily telemarketed, and uh, they will always try. Uh, a common tactic is to conflate the lower mintage with rarity. And this is just an example right. where you know there's ten million, so it's one you know twenty percent of the twenty two and thirty three percent of the twenty three. But it's still from a numismatic standpoint, you know, the, the, these are still type coins. Um, yep. But th this one, and, and again, I, the way that it's, it's just amazing, like how much di dynamic, uh, how dynamic the relief is here. The, the Morians are fairly flat and we can, we don't really need to move them around to see them, but the, this just absorbs so much light unless we move the coin around so you can see the luster. Uh, and so what can you tell me about this particular uh, coin? Uh, well, um, I find that you can actually afford to wait for the right coin to come along because it's got a, you know, a, it's got the higher population. Um, although it kind of has a spectacular look, mm -hmm. it does have a, a couple of ill-placed nicks, um, like on the obverse, the lips of Lady Liberty, that would make me hesitate on purchasing the coin unless the price was too good to be true. Right. So, but but you, um, but you do believe this is accurately graded? I do. Yeah. Because there's a lack of marks elsewhere. Right, and the and the reverse again. This is a very clean reverse, but it doesn't help the coin that much. It could only hurt it. And yeah. And the key point here is going to be Lady Liberty's face, and and you know with the way the coin is designed, you know those fields. You can't hide. There's a lot of real estate there that things can come into contact with this coin and and uh, cause it to uh, show marks. But yeah, there you go. That cheek area, as you can see, if yeah. I can get that light just right. And what would the, uh, you know, there, there, there are certainly uh, CAC quality uh, coins in this grade. Um, is there a big difference between a... a, a CAC brilliant 25 and 66 in a, in a non CAC one? Well, I think you're going to have buyers who are going to seek the CAC before, you know, serious buyers seek the CAC uh, endorsement and subsequent insurance policy as opposed to those who are not, unless the coin really speaks to you. Right. Um, but the, you know, the, with a high of 960 over the past um, 10 auction records, and a low of 384 with an average of 540. So 960 high, 384 low, average of 540. It's all low. Right. Right. So, um, well, Russ, I appreciate you. Uh, it sort of speaks to the buyer and the buyer. Once he finds a coin like that, he's willing to pay for it. Right. Right. Well, I appreciate you taking the time today, Russ. Uh, this, this is meant to be a conversation about these coins, not the final say i mean uh do your homework do your research uh and uh you know uh th this is a great series to be involved in and uh you know the the market's good for these coins know what you're buying work with the dealer um and uh and russ i mean it's been a real pleasure uh to to handle these coins and, and to go over them with you let's do it again in another series all right cool we definitely we definitely will and and just for the audience know we're getting ready to um uh, launch our a new season of the Coin Week podcast, and uh, Russ has agreed to come on as a as a recurring uh, guest uh, host with me. Uh, and uh, we're going to have a few other uh, prominent dealers do this as well, so we can have a, a just a variety of topics we can talk about and give you some real up to date market insights of what's happening. Uh, you know, on the other side of the counter as well. So, Russ, uh, I will probably start recording these in July, and, and I really appreciate you committing to doing a few episodes with me. I'm all about it. 
All right, man. Well, you take it easy. And uh, I guess the next time we're going to see each other is going to be at the a and in Rosemont. And I look forward to that. All right, Charles. Me too. All right. Take care, Russ. Thank you. Be well. Bye-bye.